You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hello and welcome to another episode of Finally, Two Guys and a Lot of Wine Again. I'm Bobby P, and in Jim's absence yet again, I have a very special host, guest host, and friend of mine, executive chef of both the Pond House and the Pond House Grill in Glassbury, a repeat guest, Mr. Jordan Stein. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Jordan, it's a pleasure to have you here. We got, I got some exciting things for you to have you taste tonight, and also eat tonight, hopefully, which will highlight the flavor of some of these great wines we're going to have tonight. I love tasting. I love drinking. So it should be a good time. Well, a couple of things I want to discuss first. I, the first thing is the concept of this show. I, I've thought about doing this the last several years. We never got around to it. And what's on the table tonight are three wines. We're actually kicking it up a vino notch tonight because we've talked in the past, as my viewers have known, I've done a lot of blind tastings with wine that have fooled people. They thought they were drinking something more expensive. But now what I've done for this show is I've actually done some research online and purchased three wines that have not just fooled people, but have fooled the experts into thinking they were drinking $50 and $60 bottles of wine. And what we're going to be tasting tonight that has fooled the experts is a French sparkling, a J.P. Chenette, a rosé, Baron Crown from California, done by a very, very talented uh, winemaker. And the big climax of the evening a really powerful Pinot Noir from California, which if the experts are right, me and Jordan will be dancing and praising the heavens after taking a sip. And I love dancing. <laughs> but who knows, that might not happen <laughs> after we taste these. But it's exciting to try it, especially something that I've never tasted before. Yeah, my, myself as well, I'm looking forward to it. And I don't think you've had any of these at all, right? None of them, no, coming in blind tonight. And I also wanna say, we're, Jordan, you're on my 20th show tonight. And I wanna thank you for being uh, on the 20th show. It might not seem like a big deal, but actually we started filming in late 2011, and we're now in mid to late 2013, mm -hmm. and still going strong. So if my calculations are right, I think we have tasted over 80 bottles of wine. That's awesome. So, awesome. now we didn't finish them all, so please, I'm not an alcoholic, I just love wine. And you know what's really cool is we do five shows in a session, so by the time we leave here, it's like 15 bottles, it's great. You yeah. should come and join us in the parking lot, That's and we're true. really dancing. <laughs> but uh, once again, thanks for being here on the 20th oh, show. It's my pleasure, and I appreciate you having me. And I, I, I want to give a toast and call out to Jim once again. I know you're going through a lot of changes out there in Boston, work's tough, and uh, marriage, you know, you're trying to get your place all set up, but we're thinking of you. We're going to be drinking some wine, thinking of you, and hope to see you soon. So we're going to go right into the French sparkling. Now, as you know, Jordan, most wines or champagnes, to be called champagne, Need have to, to be come from champagne. champagne sure. So the J.P. Chenette, I'm pronouncing that right, I think I am, um, is one that in blind tastings, people, or the experts thought they were drinking actual French champagne. And one of the give or telltale signs of that usually is the head when you pour this. So let's see if that is correct. All right, well, that's a big pour. You know what? Maybe that's for you, you're bigger than me. Yeah, you know what? I think we'll split that pour. Oh. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna notice though, and it's not exactly what I anticipated. I expected a little bit more foaminess on the Myself as well, but also it's been off of the ice for a little while. It has been off ice for about 10, yeah. 15 minutes. So. We're gonna taste this first after giving it a sniff. Not much of a head, but it's still- no, it Smells good though. Smells good. Nice little bubbles going straight up is always a good sign. Yeah. Definitely doesn't, this is not tasting like a cheap sparkling in my opinion. No, it's better than a cheap one. Yeah. 
And I can see why this might uh, fool some people's palates, even some people who have a lot more experience tasting this kind of stuff than me, though I think I have a pretty good palate. But there's a smoothness to this that, um, and I think last time you were on the show, we had an inexpensive sparkle. I think we had Lady Gaga's favorite, which was the uh, right. Robert Mondavi Brut. Right. It even smelled like Lady yeah. Gaga. <laughs> I got a lot of comments <laughs> on that, which uh, was pretty funny. Um, but that one, the bubbles were bigger and there was a little bit more metal. Yeah. Is metal the right word? I don't know. Well, you could say well, metal. metal could be the right word. It could be the right word. You it know? wasn't hideous, but you definitely knew you weren't drinking something expensive. It had an overture that was a, li a little funky there yeah. for a second. But this is nothing funky about this. I, I've got to tell you also, Bob, I love the package. Um, I think it's just a great shape and it's just really eye striking to have the low shoulders like that. And it's just a, a really nice all the way around packaging. Um, it, like, as people know who watch me, I love my French wines, and uh, the French have done it again, even designing the bottle, which is very sexy. And people buy with their eyes. Absolutely, they do. And you're going to find this locally in the area. I picked this particular bottle up uh, from a place I've mentioned before, a wise old dog here in town in West Hartford. Um, great selection, and once again, I'm very pleased. But the bigger test we're going to do now, Jordan, is for the last year or so, I've been hearing about popcorn and champagne. Popcorn and champagne. And when Jim was on uh, the show with me once, I said, yeah, Jim, that sounds like a good idea, but you don't normally serve popcorn when you're entertaining people. I mean, the kind of parties we have, people will think we're maybe getting a little uh, weird in our old age. Mm -hmm. But the word on the street is popcorn and champagne might be a big hit. Well, Shall we give it a shot? Let's give it a shot. All right. I don't know what they were thinking. Well, I might disagree with you a little. I think the saltiness of the popcorn, which is a very, it is a salty popcorn, sort of is a pleasurable experience on the tongue after taking a sip of the champagne. Yeah. It, it, I'm confused. I feel like I'm maybe at a ball game or I'm maybe at a black tie event. I haven't figured it out. Well, that was always my contention when I heard about the popcorn with the champagne. Because generally when you're serving champagne, though, for people like us, we generally drink champagne anytime we want. <laughs> but generally, most people, if they're drinking champagne, it's usually for a special occasion. You wouldn't have the popcorn out on a special occasion. Right. Uh, you know, I'm going to say I might try it again for the next time to see what people's, in a broader sense, is consensus is on the popcorn and the, uh, and the bubbles. I'm going to think those people should go back to the drawing board <laughs> <laughs> because it's just not for me. So what would you pair a bubbles like this with? Oh, and, this, is, this would be um, a great to... Put with a, a mild cheese board. Um, I also see eating uh, a nice piece of sa grilled salmon maybe on a nice salad. Um, I even think that this could hold up with, with some tomato like a caprese would be really, really good. Although I'd probably stay away from the balsamic vinegar, but you know, a mid-range olive oil and some good salt and cracked black pepper, super delicious. Well, that's interesting because one of the other foods we're going to probably taste with both the champagne and the uh, rosé, which is coming up, is a stuffed cherry pepper, hot cherry pepper with some prosciutto and some provolone, and that might go well with a champagne. Sure. And uh, do you want to give that a shot? I would love to. All right. I think you might need a little bit of a cool topper, though, on your glass. Uh -huh. I always so. say the topper is very important. And cheers to all of you out there in TV land. We appreciate you tuning in. We do, very much. All right, Jordan. I did not bring a toothpick, so... That's okay. We're all friends here. Grab you a piece. I cut these in half to make it a little bit more manageable. Okay. And I know, like me, you do like a spicy bite. Now, I what... happen to love the chilies. It is one of my favorites. Actually, that cherry pepper's got a little kick. Complete different experience, which I'm sort of happy about. That spice of the uh, cherry pepper needed to be tempered a little bit. I think that that's what the champagne does a little. The effervescence of the bubbles after the capsules from the chili really works well. That, now, see, that's great. That's what I like to hear. This is an example of different foods will taste differently with different types of food. Unlike the popcorn, which was just sort of like eating a salty snack, drinking the champagne, sparkling. Eating this particular food, which is something you would find in a nice restaurant or something you could buy on your own, I guess. But... It's definitely more elegant on your palate. Oh, it's delicious. Yeah. It's delicious. So I'll say that's a home run 
And I would say the popcorn is eh. A single? I'm going to say a double on a the double? popcorn. Okay. So we'll disagree on the uh, popcorn. Okay, that's fine. But it might be one of those things as the evening progresses, if you're having a party where probably around 11 o'clock, everything probably tastes good. So. Right. Or if it's one of those nights where you happen to pop a bottle, but you weren't planning on it, so you didn't have anything to match up with it, and you had some popcorn in your house, you could put that together and it will work as well. You know, I'm just curious, before we go into the rosé, that the pure people who come up with these ideas that you hear on the internet sort of go viral. Why a popcorn piece would be any different than a potato chip or something like that? Well, You're still I, getting the same salt. Same thing. And, it, it, you know, it might be a texture thing. Yeah. Um, also, uh, popcorn is, is so light and, and it starts to uh, disintegrate in your mouth. You don't really need to chew it. If you just let it sit there, it goes away. And potato chips perhaps might do that in a little while, but it will take longer than the popcorn. So maybe that's it. It's the clean finish and, and washing it away. Um, I think it's more texture than anything. It's just not a texture that I'm comfortable with. Yeah, that, that, from the expert, I think he's actually right. I never thought of the fact that if you take the popcorn, one or two pieces, and you let it sort of dissolve in your mouth first, and then maybe drink the uh, bubbles, it might have made a difference. But uh, I'll still give it a, a, a double, and Jordan's only going to give it a single. Cracker Jacks would have been the double, though. Oh, uh, Cracker Jacks. Yeah. I never thought Cracker of that. Cracker Jacks and champagne. How awesome would that be? It even has a you nice know, ring. When you're really good, they call you Cracker Jacks. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jordan, once again, <laughs> you've created another great expression. You heard it here first. Cracker Jacks and champagne. Oh. All right, so now we're going to go into as. People have watched the show know I'm still on my rosé kick. Summer's in full swing. Uh, Rosés are everywhere now. There's a lot of different ones out there. Um, I find them extremely refreshing this time of year, though you can still drink a rosé any time of year, in my opinion. The one we're going to drink now is called the Baron Crown. It's a California rosé. Um, it's part of the Naked Wine Group. And what the Naked Wine Group does is they take a lot of really unique, uh, talented individual winemakers, and they tell them to produce something for their name. And the Baron Crown Rosé, um, especially the 2011 varietal, is another one that in blind tasting, people thought they were drinking a $45, $50 rosé. And yes, there are $45 and $50 rosés out there. Um, a lot of people see the color, and I think, Jordan, you said it before, they think of white Zinfandel or something uh, like that. Rosés really are, to my opinion, are nothing like a Zinfandel. Uh, a lot of people, that's their first, especially a lot of women get into wine early on, drinking a white Zinfandel, but please stay away from that. I tend to find that is just more than nothing more than swill most of the time. So let's see how this rosé goes. This one you can't find locally. You might have to look online to see uh, either ordering this or if uh, a local one of your local wine stores can get it in for you. It's got a beautiful color in the glass it right does. away. That's for sure. Um, Very mild aroma, which would you you would expect for a rosé. It's got a great nose, though. It's got a great nose. There are some legs on it. That's fantastic. That sure is. Yeah. Um, I've done a, several rosés on the show over the last, especially this year. Chilean, I've done a few. Um, this is my first, actually, American rosé. And i got to be honest with you, this is really something. You put a plate full of oysters in front of you. And the rosé right here, you're, you're not moving for a while, and you might order another bottle and another round of oysters. You know, you, people are going to be seeing this show in September because, uh, you know, like everybody else, Bobby P. is going to be taking the month of August off, and uh, I think, Jordan, you're going to be on vacation too sometime during that time. Hopefully. And uh, summer will be over technically, but September is still a great month to... Uh, to have rosé and to oysters. To have rosé and oysters. Yeah, Why sounds, not? Sounds like a plan. Actually, when is it ever not good to have Oysters uh, both and of those wine. things are way up on my list. So, You know, I, I tend not to get overly technical with terminology on this show, and that's one of the main reasons I've done, I did this show, because I, I don't want people to get turned off by the technical aspects of drinking wine. Mm. And the, there's a certain or aroma, not aroma, but a certain air about people who drink wine, and you know, they're either snooty, not so much anymore. But there's plenty of shows that you can get the technical, like the wine is made this way or this vineyard is this way. What I like to do is try stuff that I've done myself or do some experimenting on my own and just talk as basic as I can so I don't alienate or scare any viewers from trying wine. Well, and I think at this day and age, and it, and it refers back to food too, there's no right or wrong way. You do what you like to do. You eat what you like to eat and you drink what you like to drink. And it doesn't, no one's going to tell you you can't have a Chardonnay with a steak. Well, well if they do tell you that. <laughs> 
<laughs> there are and, some people that will do that, but uh, and they will because they they like it, and that's what they like. And I personally, I don't believe there's anything wrong in doing what you like to do. And who's to tell you what you can and cannot do, and what's right and what's wrong? It's food. It's food yeah. and wine. Yeah. And uh, the reason I love wine is because I spent a lot of years trying different wine, and the best way to find out whether you like something or not is to try it. Yeah, I spent a lot of years trying <laughs> lots of food, um, so. I know what I like and what I don't, but oysters and this rosé. Do you think it. it's uh, worth trying a, another piece of this? Oh, I would love to try it. All that. right. Even if it doesn't go well, I want to try it anyway. I'll yeah, take a piece go for here. the little one here. All right. The cheese is so creamy, it's taken us a second. We apologize. Eating on camera is always a uh, tough call. See, now I wouldn't recommend that with this. No. It's, the acidity level's not yeah. high enough. It's not washing it away. It's just not holding up to that. Um, There's something somewhat unpleasant about uh, still the aftertaste. Yeah, it's just not going well with the, the capsums or uh, the cheese. And the prosciutto gets kind of lost. In it sure anyway, does. Yeah, so. But once again, that's why you watch the show, people, to yeah. find out what you should and shouldn't pair with different things. Oysters. Oysters, though, I think would be phenomenal. Yeah. I, actually, I, I did an oyster show once a few shows back, and I actually had some oysters on the show. And uh, I wish I had done that this time, but I'll do it next time. Next for you. time. But something like this, what would you pair this particular rosé with in your restaurant? Well, I, you know, I think that this would go with a lot of different things. Any of the white fish... Uh, shellfish for sure, scallops, whether they're cooked um, or served mid-rare. Um, either way, I even think that this could hold up uh, to a very, very delicate fish and chips. Uh, maybe um, a tilapia sandwich or a flounder sandwich, something that was very, very lightly uh, breaded and fried. Um, it's just very, very clean. Uh, again, I wouldn't put or anticipate eating anything that was too mu too fatty or had a, a big, big mouth feel with this uh, because it just w doesn't have the acidity to wash it back and there's not enough tannins in here um, to, to wash it away. But something that was easy eating, um, great in the summer, any salads, it will go great with tomatoes um, and, and different great, great grilled vegetables. This would be great with grilled vegetables. Yes. Um, so you know, if you look at it like that into your midsummer to late summer fare, uh, this is something perfect uh, to, to pair up with it. It would be wonderful. Yeah, and once again, like I said, uh, rosés to me are still one of my favorite wines this year. For 2013, rosés have really been my go-to. and uh, But this particular California 2011 uh, is up there on the top. And I just got to tell everybody, that means a lot because... <clears throat> For it to be a Bobby go-to, you know, uh, he knows his stuff. So Well, what I didn't realize is eating that hot pepper and being under the studio lights would make Bobby P. sweat a little. Yeah. But uh, that's okay. This will help out a little bit. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to give that one a definite thumbs up. I own, It's like a, a <clears throat> thumb up and a half, I think, for me. I'm really yeah. very, very impressed. Uh, so, so far, my research has paid off. The first two uh, have been very successful. Yeah, they've been great. But great. now, here comes the part where do me and Jordan start praying to the heavens for, or thanking the heavens for what we're about to drink. We will find out. Yes. Let's dive into it. I realize your glass is not that clean. Want to grab another glass? Sure, there? that'd be great. Now, ideally, I would have let this breathe just a tad bit longer than we have on the show tonight. But time was not on our side. So, Jordan... I'm going to give that a little swirl and give it a smell. Now, the Black uh, Ridge Vineyard Pinot Noir that we're drinking tonight um, has a great reputation. Once again, I recommend anybody who's watching the show tonight to do your own research. But this particular Black Ridge Pinot Noir has really knocked a lot of people's socks right off. And we're about to find out if it's going to knock our socks off. Well, right away, the nose and, and the color are great. Oh, and that's just marvelous. You know, the heat of the cherry pepper has been washed away a little bit by the loveliness and the smoothness. Yeah, but right up front, you can already tell it's cushy and gushy and just delicious. And what Jordan is saying actually might sound funny, but that's exactly what's going on in the uh, mouth. It's cushy. It's really soft on the palate. You forgot gushy. Gushy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're right. I did forget so, the gushy. 
but it, but it's just beautiful. What an easy what an easy drinking uh, bottle. And Pinot Noirs are are just the the crown jewel in in my opinion. And when you get a good one or you get one that you know like stands up and puts its shoulders back and and comes to your glass and, and drinks like this, you 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 have a treat. You have a treat on your hands and and uh, good pick, Bob. Well, I know you have some great wines in both your uh, restaurants, but something like this Pinot Noir, what would you pair with that? Man, you can go all over the gamut with it. I mean, it's it's not too big where it couldn't be a crossover. Um, you know, at first glance, you would say that you, you anything braised would be great. I mean, you can go red meat. You can you can even put this up to some game stuff as long as it wasn't too far over the threshold of being gamey. Um, it would go great with grilled chicken. Um, it would hold up to collard greens. You could uh, have it with cheese. You could put cheese in the grits. You could have it with grilled shrimp. You could have it with shrimp cocktail. There's just so many things. It's just such a versatile drink. Um, it just drinks so easy. And anything that you like, if you're a Pinot Noir fan, you could match up with this one. Though I gotta say, because I'm still recovering from the after effects, I don't think I'm gonna pair a stuffed cherry pepper with the <laughs> Pinot Noir. <laughs> a little too hot, I yeah, think. Yeah, that might be a little too hot. But actually, maybe a little piece of cheese might not be too bad. I think that's just a regular New York sharp cheese. But uh, I, was, I, I knew going into this, the Black Ridge was going to be exciting. And we've only done a few Pinot Noirs on the show, in the almost three years we've been doing the show. And uh, this one, by far, takes the cake for probably one of my well, favorites. And also, if you put your nose back in it, I mean, now you're starting to get the, the black cherries. Mm -hmm. um, you're starting to get uh, some cedar. There's just a really, really good nose. It, it's changing just in a few minutes. So I think you're right. It, um, as the bottle goes down and it, the air gets to it a bit more, it's just going to keep changing, which is always a good sign in any wine that you drink. Well, that's a very important fact. I mean, generally, you know, we do a 30-minute show. We can't actually, it's not always possible to prepare these wines for the amount of time that you generally would need if you were actually serving them to people. Right. I can only imagine that if this was decantered or opened up for another 20 or 30 minutes, the flavor would probably even be better. It would be. It would have a, a wonderful bouquet, and it already does, but it would just be that much better. So, you know, I just want to remind people that, so what we're drinking tonight is, once again, if you really want to impress your friends, and this show has always been about drinking inexpensive wines that taste like expensive wines, but now we're drinking wines that actually have fooled the experts. So write these down, do some research, buy them, and impress your friends, because I think uh, you'll be scoring some points. I really do. They're all three great in their own respects. Um, so, and I also think that the three of them could be brought out in the same night. And so as you're going through a party or you're going through a night of eating, whether it's with friends or in a restaurant, uh, you'd be very happy with all of them in the progression that they take. Now, I know you have two very successful restaurants yourself that you're part of. And uh, when you bring in wine, do you actually do a tasting with all the wines that you bring in? We do do a tasting. In fact, we do a little too much tasting sometimes. There's, <clears throat> pardon me, there's uh, a lot of stuff out there and it's all wonderful, but you only have so much uh, space, space on your wine list space um, in your storage uh, and and you know you don't want to get too caught up with your wine inventory and it, it, it's the kind of thing that you also you want some stuff that is new and boutique -y, but you want some recognizable stuff as well um, and it really all depends if you get uh, something like this and put a good story behind it and and sell it to the servers so that they really love it and they're on board with what's going on, then it makes it a little bit easier to pass on that information to your patrons. And a patron likes nothing more than to come in and hear a great story and find something new and find something exciting and something they really, really like. And if somebody likes a rosé and they came in and they had that, then they would just love it and they would think it's wonderful. And they would be so happy walking away from that meal knowing that they found something that they really liked that was new. Everybody's looking for something new. So um, at the end of the day, uh, it, it's really, really important that uh, from a restaurant point of view that we can bring some stuff in that's both familiar and different at the same time. Well, that's the same thing with my drinking wine experience. When, when you try something that you really like, you talk about it, you tell your friends. When you go to a restaurant, your restaurants, if you try something, whether it be food or the wine that you're paying with that food that you might only be able to get in your place, you're going to tell people and they're going to remember that. That's right. So, and I wish I could have brought a fourth one. I was thinking of toying with bringing in a, a, a white um, to accompany these, but I didn't think we'd get to it. And I thought these three would really be a good testament to uh, what we're drinking tonight. <laughs> but once again, people, please don't eat cherry stuffed peppers on TV. 
because uh, they really do make you feel. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when you're watching this show, by the way, it's 98 degrees out today. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah. yeah. So you're going to be watching in September, and it's not going to be 98 degrees. So you'll be enjoying yourself a little bit more than we were today earlier. Now, but let the, me ask you a question, Bob. If you were to have to pick the two and you were going out to, in, to dinner, which, what are the two of the three favorites that you would great have? Great question. Generally, as Jordan knows, I usually always have two bottles whenever I go out somewhere. He's lying. He has more than two. Well, I don't want to offend anybody. Oh, okay. Generally, though, if I have two bottles, if I only pick one bottle on this table tonight and I was going out for dinner, I'm going to go with the Pinot Noir. Really? Yeah. Well, only I thought you were going to say the sparkling. You know why? Because the sparkling, as much as I love a good sparkling and a bubbly, I drink them faster because mm. they're cold. You want to drink them before they get a little warm. The red, though, you can linger with that. It can sit in your glass. You can talk to somebody and not think that your poor bubbles is getting room temperature right, and you right. can't drink it. It's the same with the rosé. Now, a good rosé, you can let get room temperature and still enjoy it. Um, but you could never go wrong with a quality red that is just sitting there as you're having a great conversation, a great food, a great beef wellington, which Jordan makes a fantastic <laughs> one. Actually, your first time I ever had a beef wellington was at the, the pond house that you made for me. And I still rave about it yeah that was uh, a that was a special night we we foraged some mushrooms i don't know if it was your, for your birthday or your wife's birthday i forget but it was a special occasion and um man we had some chicken in the woods and some hen in the woods and we got some fresh chanterelles in and we made this wellington with all these big chunks of mushrooms and we put a big fat piece of foie gras in there and it was just outstanding in fact we made an extra one and the cooks ate it that night it was a treat for them too so we loved when they had to special order that because they have to make another one in case of one course bad right you know so we got a chance to eat that it was just wonderful it was wonderful and and this would definitely hold up this oh, pinot noir would it would hold certainly up hold up so. And, you know, I know we're almost at the end of the show, and I, I wanted to say for those of you who, once again, enjoyed what you're seeing tonight, please like us on Facebook. Check out our uh, Facebook page. All the wines that you see here tonight will be up on the Facebook page so you can try them yourself. And, Jordan, I know, uh, once again, you have two successful restaurants. You're a busy man. I really appreciate you having the time to come in tonight. Oh, it's my pleasure. And uh, I'm pretty sure Jordan's going to go walk around West Hartford after this show and enjoy West Hartford. Oh, West Hartford is uh, just an amazing food town, and I... Uh Encourage everyone to go out to eat. Yeah, absolutely. Enjoy restaurants, enjoy wine, and uh, do it responsibly, but enjoy it. And once again, thanks for watching. I'm Bobby P. And I'm Jordan. Keep us both in your wine cellar. <laughs>